great to have Scott Havens. Thank, Thank you so you. much for being here. It's like to be here. Uh, Scott, let's start this way. I know of you from before your baseball life as a media exec. Media, what a great industry. You were at Time Inc., Bloomberg. Uh, talk to us about going from the media to the ballpark. Um, nice to see you again. Um, welcome, everybody. Hopefully, you have lots of Mets fans here. There's still time for you Yankees fans. Um, it's uh, moving from media to sports, which was not on the career roadmap, uh, is actually not as wildly different as I think people thought uh, when I took this job. There were a lot of gasps, including from my boss, Mike Bloomberg, who said, why the F would Steve Cohen hire you to do this? You know nothing about sports. Um, but um, the, the, the similarities are there. We sell tickets, we sell sponsorships. You know, at Bloomberg Media, we had a global multi-platform media business. We had 60 live events a year. We sold subscriptions. We sold marketing activations. And so a lot of the functional parts of running a baseball team, especially where we're going, where we need to go as a sport and as a franchise, we're already, I've already done some of that work. Um, I think there are new things that I've been, you know, I've had to jump into that I had no experience with. How do you price hot dogs? Uh, are, are we worried if we do dollar dog night that they'll all end up on the field? Should we take that risk? How do you harness the rally pimp or grimace? Uh, oh, you know, we're we're going to talk about uh, grimace. We'll talk about grimace. Um, and, um, and security and coming up with an anti-drone system on the top of City Field. I mean, these are things that I most certainly didn't deal with. But I do look at sports as the new media. I was very excited for this opportunity because I, I think there's an opportunity for MLB and, and the Mets to modernize and think differently. And um, so, yeah, not wildly different. Um, and ultimately, like every business, you got to hire great people, um, build a great, supportive, inclusive culture, and you can be successful. So that's what we're trying to do. There's so much to talk about when it comes to the business of baseball, especially we are talking about it at a great time when... Uh, a lot of metrics are up thanks to changes to the game. But if we pause that for just a second and keep it focused on media, uh, when you look around at the landscape right now of the changes to how we consume live sports, I and mean, we've just seen a mega massive NBA and WNBA media rights deal, we also see news every few days about the uh, struggle and epic saga of the RSNs, the regional sports networks, many of which are the only place to see your baseball team. Uh, talk to me about what you see happening in the next few years because it is not simple, not easy to be in the business of broadcasting and distributing baseball games. Uh, no, it's certainly not. And I'm not sure everyone knows how important the RSN monies are to teams. Um, you're seeing decisions on your players being made because of current or future revenue streams from RSNs being cut. I don't think Juan Soto is in New York if San Diego didn't run into a problem. So that, that has real impact. Um, I had a front row seat on um, what's happening now in a different industry, which is the magazine business. Uh, I watched uh, front row at Condé Nast and, and, and The Atlantic and Time Inc. on when disruption happens, uh, uh, the pain of it and, and the need to, to innovate and, and, and do something else, frankly, create a new model. Uh, baseball teams need to do the same thing because the RSN money is going nowhere but down um, some would argue 40 to 60% lower once you come off your current contracts. Diamond, which has a bunch, the former Bally's just renegotiated the big deal with Comcast. They got stuck up on a higher tier for 70 bucks a month. Guess how many people are gonna take that package? Not many. Like this is not a good situation because um, it was forced through to the consumer. So this, we're in the middle of it and it's gonna get far worse before it gets better, but Maybe, like the news business, there's hope on the platform side. So it's not going to be broadcast anymore. It's going to be platform cast. And guess who's paying the NBA, WNBA uh, fees? It's Amazon, Google, Apple. And it's not going to be Comcast and TNT and others. It's changing. And you got to go where the money is. And those guys need deep engagement on their platforms. They're in involved in their own struggle. So it's going to be rough. Uh, we're fortunate that we have a, a good partner who, uh, SNY, which we do not own, um, who is stable for now. Uh, it's a good market in New York. And um, we, can, we can work together. And we, and we have, by the way, I've invested in that relationship for the last seven months I've been there to ensure that they have a longer lifespan uh, than they might ought to. So it's going to be rough. 
Yeah, we're, I, I always say it seems like we're living through a prolonged uh, transition period, uh, and obviously the, the dust will clear at some point. Is there any future in, in our lifetime, Scott, where what everyone wants is a reality? And, and what I mean is what everyone wants is just tell me the fee I have to pay for the one app where I can watch all my one team's games. I'll pay probably a pretty big amount if I could watch every Red Sox game, every Pats game. I, I don't know that there's a perfect world for that. There are, like, MLB.TV is a pretty good product for those of you who have it. It's not flawless, but I think they've made good improvements. They're trying to change the viewing experience as well. Um, but the, the problem with that model or that product is you can't get in-market games. So our situation in New York, metro area, SNY was, uh, if, you, if you don't want to get a cable subscription, you can watch us, the Mets, in market on Hulu. FUBU dropped SNY. Hulu may drop SNY, we hope not. And you can't get MLB.TV in market because of the cable deals and the MFNs of and the agreements there. So that, that has to get fixed. The idea that you cannot give your customers a product that they will pay for is a major, major problem. But MLB knows this, and they're working towards uh, a better solution there. I do think, you know, again, I don't run the Major League Baseball, but uh, I, I do think <laughs> it would behoove us to be working more closely together. I think 30 disparate RSNs, it's not actually 30, but um, uh, isn't that probably not as, as powerful a conglomerate to go into Google or Amazon or Apple? Um, I mean, NBA was able to nationalize a lot of rights, too, and NFL has it done at a central location, so, and they're making a lot of money. So I think there's a model there for us, too. Yeah, even as you explain the different options, it's, it's understandably head-spinning for people, you know, yeah. and FUBU and Hulu. Oh, Hulu and, um, let's talk about the business of baseball, and what I mean is the fans, the interest, the eyeballs. There have been some changes to the game that maybe the growing pains were tough, and Manfred, uh, the commissioner of the league, took, took a lot of heat, but it sure looks like a lot of it is working. Attendance is up. Um, ticket sales and, and uh, TV ratings. Talk to me about what you've seen in the last couple seasons with changing the game in order to make games shorter, the pitch clock, uh, what the impact has been. Uh, I, think, I think largely positive, and there, previous to those changes, there hadn't been any changes, I don't think, to the sport, real changes since the 70s. So it's a pretty traditional uh, business, for sure. Um, there's a legacy that goes back, you know, into the previous century, and and, and there's just a, a, a trepidation to make real changes to this sport. And, um, but that's a real problem if you're disrupted by the fragmentation of attention with children. Uh, other sports, I am really proud of all the women's sports. Midge was just up here. Um, but there, you know, when the fever or, or the liberty sell out, it can be at the expense of maybe your family used to go to a baseball game. You know, we are not anywhere near it being the, the national pastime of, of the yesteryear. So there's a, lo a lot of work to be done uh, there, but but those changes were good. The the length of a baseball game had gotten pretty excruciating. You you know had managers changing pitchers uh, frequently, lefty right matchups. You had um, mound visits. You had you know stealing had stopped, base stealing, and so now we're down to two hours and thirty six minutes. Last time I heard, which is a more reasonable game length. You can't go to the mound every pitch, all that kind of stuff. So that's good. Is that, should that be the end of the changes? 100% no. Um, and we have a, you know, big supply issue. Uh, it's, and I haven't really thought about this, but now that I oversee the ticketing business, uh, how do you fill up what, 81 games and 42,000 seats with all this competition for attention out there? It's really hard. Even the Yankees and the Dodgers can't do it every night. Um, and we have twice as many games as the NHL and the NBA. That's, that's hard on the supply side. It's a long season grind. Yeah, I remember when the famous Red Sox uh, sellout streak ended dramatically. Uh, I'm, I'm big on disclosing your biases. Everyone has their teams. I'm a Boston guy, but respect the Mets. Um, let Thank you, Boston, for 1986. <laughs> um, let's, let's get into, you know, drilling down on the marketability of the players, right? And, uh, boy, I've been covering sports business in, since 2010, and uh, a favorite catchphrase and something that always comes up is, who's the face of baseball? People love to do that part of the game, the face of baseball. And, uh, Scott, in our, in our pre-chat, our pre-call, I appreciated when you said, we really don't do a, a good enough job marketing our, our players. I appreciated the, the candor there. Talk to us a little bit more about that. What should the league be doing differently? Because it's easy enough to say that. Well, 
what do you do to make people see more of a Mike Trout and to see more of a um, Xander Bogarts? Um, yeah, I think right now the face of baseball probably is two people, Otani and Aaron Judge, you know, on the two coasts, and that's not great because there's electric young players playing this game that unless you're dating a, a gymnast who has a big social media following, they're not going to know your name. Um, but I think that's, there's a lot of lessons in, in, in that for sure, but, uh, and with Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift uh, for teams and leagues. Um, I just don't think baseball and teams have invested in the storytelling. I mean, a lot of these players have amazing stories, um, and Netflix and other platforms have been buying and funding documentaries. Hard Knocks on Football is a very watchable show. Um, the, the PGA Tour, uh, F1. Full Swing. Yeah. Full Swing, yeah, by Chad. Um, uh, the drive or whatever. Yeah, there have been a bunch of the, and I think baseball's working on one, so this is good. Uh, we just need to pick up the pace and be more front-leaning than, than following up, I think. Um, for the Mets, we've got amazing stories. I listened to um, the king of OMG, Jose Iglesias, the other day speak to our Los Mets employee research, uh, resource group, ERG, um, about his um, life in Cuba and how he was cut and almost out of baseball, and then how he took less money to go to the Red Sox because his dad loved the Red Sox. It was like a fascinating story, and I think almost nobody knows, knows this story. It was told to 50 people. That, that should be something that our video team, which I'm investing in, captures um, in an appropriate way and, and, and puts it out there for our fans and, other, and fans of baseball and human stories to, to engage with. By the way, great, some of these great vehicles for brands. Um, we can get into it, but you know, if you think about the, the, this quote ad sales team or partnerships teams or sports, they, they're used to selling wall space, you know, and, and maybe they throw in a suite, a hospitality, but, but they're not thinking about, as media companies, on how do you work UBS into a um, six part series on Jose Iglesias' trip to the uh, MLB, which is compelling content. So there's a lot of work to be done there at the MLB level. I think they're on, they're focused on the right things. I think they did a really nice job around the Rickwood um, uh, rebuild and marketing. I think they're focused on younger demographics right now. We've played the Phillies in London, so there's an international focus every year. I think the Williamsport Little League game is going on soon. Um, I think they're trying, but I also think more money probably needs to be put into the marketing budget in a way that NBA and NFL do more of. You mentioned Otani. Uh, we have the privilege of having a baseball business exec here. I have to ask about legalized gambling because of the effect that it has had on major leagues. Uh, it's just a, an ongoing fascination and, and a big story. The partnerships, uh, how deeply embedded the leagues are with them, the problems we've seen result with individual players betting on sports. Uh, how do you navigate this from, from your perch at the Mets? Well, I think MLB does a pretty good job of ensuring compliance at the front office and player level. Uh, my entire staff had to go through some mandatory training. Um, the rules are pretty clear, zero, zero tolerance. Um, but there's only so much you can do. And we are talking about, both on the staff level and on the player level, some young kids in many cases. And we have team players on our team who are in their early 20s. Um, and so the temptation perhaps, uh, to do things uh, to help their family back home or whatever can be there. And um, so I'm, I'm very supportive of regulating gambling. Uh, I had friends in college that ran a sports book, so it's not like it's the first time this has been happening. Um, they're no longer friends, obviously. But um, the, uh, so, th so I've been betting with my buddies the whole time. The fact that there's a place to do it now that's regulated and legal is a good thing, and it's a huge business. I think like everything the new, AI, the internet, gambling online, the, it gets way, way out in front of the regulators uh, and their ability to understand it and put in the right, right, right rules. And I think Lee Steinberg wrote a good piece for the New York Times recently um, about it, and you should read it. Uh, and, and the prop bet stuff is, is, is a little bit concerning. This is as an individual. Um, you know, the fact that you can influence, if, if there's a bet on you strike out at your first at bat, I mean, that's pretty easy to do and still have a good game and no one's going to notice it and maybe you got some money under the table. We don't need that in baseball. And you've seen the MLB come down on a couple players lately for 
kind of inadvertently putting 100 bucks up or something. So it's a zero, zero tolerance, and they know it, and you won't see many examples of it. But, um, but, but it's big business for us. Um, unfortunately, the New York State taxes uh, gambling uh, at, I think it's 50%. So I would love for that to change um, so that we get more of those guys spending money on acquisition. Because right now they're like, no way New York City. And that's a, that's a key play. I mean, you watched all the DraftKings FanDuel ads for the last five years. Talk about money flowing to yep. TV and, 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 and RSNs and cable. It was amazing. And we're not getting it right now. Everyone in this crowd has seen probably enough DraftKings FanDuel ads for a lifetime. Uh, while we have you, Scott, with the time remaining, who in the audience knows what I'm talking about if I say we have to talk about Grimace and the Mets? Like, a couple of hands up. OK. Pretty big viral marketing moment. And I mean, in seriousness, like this, this stuff matters. And you can only kind of um, plan it and, and force it to a certain extent. Sometimes it gets away from you in a good way. Talk to us about exactly, you know, tell those who don't know what happened with Grimace yeah. and the Mets in City Field. Uh, so before I get into it, I think if you don't know the psychology of a Mets fan, I think it's important uh, as part of this, which is, uh, and I think there was a book written about this um, years ago, but. You're, you're always uh, on the precipice of catastrophic collapse in your mind um, and hope that there's going to be a magical run to win the World Series. And more often than not, it's been the, the former. Um, and so you have this kind of like heartbroken fan base that is clinging to anything for hope. It has been a long time since we won the World Series. And um, you wouldn't see, by the way, this would never have happened in the Bronx. Never, ever have happened in the Bronx because 27 world titles, we're the Yankees, blah, blah. So anyway, what happened, that, that's the psychology. So when things pop up that are, can be loosely correlated to a winning streak, Mets fans jump on this. And if you follow the Mets, we had a disastrous May. Started off disastrous, then we turned it around, and then May, they lost every night in a way that was excruciating. Um, and it was culminated probably with glove gate, with a reliever throwing his glove over the fence, and led to a team meeting, it, it was a bottoming out. So that happens, the team get, comes together, we start winning right when Grimace, who we invited to throw the first pitch out, you might not even remember Grimace, he is this big purple blob Thank you. that the McDonald's used with Mayor McCheese, the Hamburglar in the 70s and 80s. I actually thought Grimace was a purple chicken nugget, but yeah. I could be wrong about it's, that. It's a taste bud apparently and a milkshake stealer. Um, I did my own research on this. and. Uh, so Grimace is out of like culture for a long time, mostly. He shows up, and he did other first pitches, by the way, other places, nothing happened like this. He was playful behind the seats with the pitcher, which caught on. Anyway, we won the game. We then started winning. All of a sudden, the fans started using this meme as the reason that we were 6-0. It's the Grimace era. And you know how things go virally. Uh, it just became a thing. And so we have, with the social media team that we're investing in, and we jumped on it very quickly. We most certainly didn't start the fire, um, but we put gasoline on it, and then we called McDonald's and said, do you want to collaborate on this and do purple shakes, and do you want to lean into this on your handle on social media? And they said, yes, of course. And, and so it became even bigger uh, opportunity. Uh, and we even wove them into, if you saw our schedule release video, for 2025, um, that is an event, which I'm a, a new thing to be learned. Uh, we wove, we did like a rip, actually I shouldn't say this, um, a similar um, video to Mario Kart by Nintendo. And um, uh, and in there, you'll see Grimace at the start. Copyright. Starting. Yeah, com I mean, I'm waiting for the, anyway, don't put that in the news. Um, and um, different game. But, uh, but anyway, in that video, you will see uh, Grimace, you will see a McDonald's on the side of the road, and I thought that was a really creative way to loop in a brand partner in a way that we had not done before, um, and so we did that. But, but yes, and then there was the rally pimp, Max Wiener, there was Seymour Wiener, who coincided with Hot Dog Night, $1 Hot Dog Night, and then, of course, Jose Iglesias, Oh My God, which has become a thing, too. It's our home run um, song now, and we've got a sign in the dugout. It's like a... So this is, the, but that's the mentality that makes these things possible for the Mets. It's and it's fun, and exciting for the fans, and we just try and lean into it. It's not really ours. If we tried to make it the Mets, then it wouldn't be as organic. 
It's fun to talk about it. It's funny, but also in seriousness, I mean, this is how you mobilize a fan base around viral moments, so it's pretty cool. Um, one question left for you, and it, it, it will work for us as our looking forward crystal ball topic. Um, tell everyone about the real estate mega development that's about to happen, $8 billion project if it goes through. Um, what is happening in and around City Field? And of course, coming up, we've got the US Open just a few uh, you know, steps away and, and the Willits point stop. What are we gonna see there in the next like decade? Hopefully, good things. Um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot happening at the former um, ash dump uh, for New York City, which is what it was for a long time. Um, the um, the project that, that you're referring to, uh, Metropolitan Park, which is an eight billion dollar reimagining of the space between the subway and City Field, essentially, and the marina, if you know the area, um, it is unbelievable. Um, it's a partnership, it's a separate joint venture for Steve Cohen and, and, and Hard Rock. Um, the, the, the challenge, of course, is you have to get um, the, the regulation, the designation of the land changed. Uh, Robert Moses made that park land, so um, you have that. And then you've got to win a gambling license because that's the economic engine. So they're working hard to get those. There's no question that the vision of this um, uh, resort, casino, is going to be incredibly amazing for the fans of, of, uh, of the Mets, the FC across the street, which I'll talk about, uh, and just New Yorkers in general. It will bring a ton of revenue in, 15,000 jobs. It's a, it's a great opportunity, but it has um, some hurdles ahead of it. Um, the Related Co's across the street has um, been building, and I hear, hear it every day, they're putting up the NYFC stadium, which is really cool if you haven't seen the designs. Um, we, we host their games, many of their games today. Um, they're building a, I think it's 2,500 low um, income housing. They're building a boutique hotel, a school. So that, that whole part where, which is traditionally known as the Chop Shop uh, Avenue is, is, is kind of being displaced and being developed. So then you have the US Open, which is an amazing, amazing experience. I'm sure you've all been there. That thing makes as much money as we do in two weeks, uh, annually as, as we do in two weeks. And um, so you can imagine a future for New Yorkers where you fly into LaGuardia and, and by ferry, maybe by underground uh, boring company or something, uh, you get over to Willits Point and you've got an entire park. You've got soccer and football, soccer, so soccer or football, baseball. Um, you've got tennis, uh, pickleball and everything else. It, it, we'll see. But I think it, Willits Point would be a destination not unlike, you know, Vegas in some ways. And it will certainly benefit the Mets as well with the fan base. Uh, well, yeah, look, it'll be disruptive mm -hmm. <laughs> for a while. Um, think of all of our parking lot will be parkland. Um, so we have to build vertically. Um, so that, like, like the Yankees, when you go park, you got to go into it. So the things will change. Um, it will take years to build, right? So there'll be some of that. But you will have hundreds of thousands of people coming in and out of there um, uh, at certain moments of time. And you'll have a constant base of people that are in the park. And so, yes. City Field will cease to, to, to be a, a, a stadium or a ballpark that we use 80, hopefully 90, 95 times a year. Um, and we'll end up being a 365 enterprise. We'll have restaurants and other things that appeal to people that live across the street and that are there for the park. So that'll be amazing if it happens. Sounds really exciting. Uh, we have to leave it there, except, Scott, uh, real quick, Juan Soto to the Mets or what? <laughs> uh, we think he's a tremendous baseball player. We'd love to have him in, uh, in Queens. Can we give Scott a round of applause?